stand and join me in the call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be and be glad. The Eternal Father, who loved us and set us free from our sins. Who loves us still with that love that will not let us go, and who loves us forever. Call us to the Lord, excuse me, calls us to worship him today as the only true lover of our souls. The Lord speaks to He calls us to remember the depth of his love for us in Christ. God sees our love. Come, let us praise the God of our salvation. Nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Let us in freedom confess the wrong we have done, first using the prayer of confession, followed by a time of personal silent confession. Let us pray. There are many times we think we love you well, O oh God, but upon hearing your call to love you with all our hearts and all our mind and all our strength, we confess that our love for you is a deluded love, made insipid and flat by lesser loyalties in the divided heart. Our love seems pure only for brief moments. Soon our affections are drawn away. How easily our devotion ebbs. Forgive us. Indeed, mercy spare us. In grace, we kindle our love for you. And sing a new Jesus' love for us. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his grace in which we stand. God has gifted us with his love and grace. Thanks be to God. Would the children please come forward? Good morning. Good morning. Let me ask you guys a question. What time of year is it? What season are we in right now? Who knows, Bella? The fall, and that is my favorite season. What are some things that you guys like about the fall? What's something that you like about it, Ashlyn? Halloween is coming up. That's right. What is something else that you like? Yes, ma'am. What is it? Football. I really love football, especially this year. <laughs> Eli, what do you like? Candy. What's something you like, Logan? Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving, too, Logan. That's a great answer. What's something you like? Jumping in the leaves. I love that, too. That's a great idea. One of my favorite things about this time of year, first of all, it starts to get a little bit cooler. And second of all, the leaves start to change color. And I love how they are so beautiful. Now, let me ask you a question. Who makes the leaves change color? Yeah, God does. You're right. You're exactly right. So the same way that God changes the color of the leaves every single year, did you know that God brings change to our lives? Yeah, he does. And sometimes we're kind of scared about that change. I don't know about y'all, but I don't really like change. When I was in the seventh grade, I had to change schools. And I was really nervous because I didn't know a whole lot of people at my new school. And I would feel sick at night, and I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. And I was so worried about it. And on the first day of school, I went to school, and my heart was pounding. And I walked into that classroom, and this girl looked up, and she smiled at me. And she said, hey, come sit over here with me. And I felt so much better. And we became good friends, and I met lots of other friends that I'm really, really close to still today. And it ended up being a blessing in my life. Even though that change was very, very hard, God brought me wonderful gifts and blessings from that change. And so we all have changes that we have to go through sometimes. Can you guys think of a change that you've had to go through that was kind of hard? Bella? Yeah, change into a new school, that's very scary, isn't it? But then you meet lots of new friends, too. So you have your old friends and your new friends. And so God blesses you through that hard change. Has anybody else gone through a hard change? Did you think of another one? Okay. Yeah. Okay, you don't like it changing from the fall to the winter time. Yeah. <laughs> it gets a little cold then, doesn't it? <laughs> So the wonderful thing about this time of year is the leaves remind us they are so beautiful and they remind us that change in our lives is beautiful as well. Even though we get nervous about it and it might be hard, that God is going to bring us blessings from that change. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for this day and thank you for the beautiful leaves and for the changes that you bring to our lives. Please give us courage to make it through those changes and to know that you're going to bless us through those changes. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. If you're going to Children's Church, you may go ahead and go down. And if you're going back to your seat, you may go back to your parents. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Almighty, gracious Father, 
true understanding of your holy word helps us to grow into the fullness of the salvation you so freely offer in Christ. Grant to all of us that our hearts, being free from worldly affairs, may hear and grasp your holy word with all diligence and faith, that we may rightly understand your gracious will, cherish it, and live by it with all earnestness. To your praise and honor, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's epistle reading is uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. That's uh, page 192 in your few Bibles. From death to life. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable richness of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life.
wonderful rendition of a wonderful piece for this Reformation Sunday. Thank you. Well, there were a lot of reasons why the Protestant Reformation started almost 500 years ago. The fact that the Bible was only available in the Latin language and services were conducted in Latin rather than in the languages of the people. The fact that the church was so clergy oriented and so wealthy and so dismissive of lay people. But undoubtedly the biggest issue that triggered the Protestant Reformation was how the church had come to understand the issue of salvation. When Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the church door of Wittenberg, Germany on October 31st, 1517, the first, uh, first two of these 95 points on which he wanted the church to have a debate had to do with this issue of salvation. And a number of the other theses also touched on it in one way or the other. Discontent had been growing for some time but the match that finally ignited the powder keg came when the Catholic Church wanted to build the magnificent St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. One of the marketing concepts they came up with was to sell what were called indulgences. These were marketed to the people in the pews saying that the purchase of an indulgence would lead to the forgiveness of sins and they were signed by the Pope. It was like buying a get out of jail free card. And that was bad enough, but it was also advertised that you could purchase one of these indulgences to help a loved one who had already died get into heaven. How could that be, you ask? Well, one of the teachings of Catholicism was that after you die, you go to purgatory to await your ultimate judgment and be assigned to either heaven or hell and while you're in purgatory, your loved ones can pray on your behalf. But with the sale of indulgences came the promise that in buying these indulgences, you could do something concrete to help the pendulum swing towards heaven for your loved ones who had already died. A priest named Tetzel, in fact, went from town to town selling these indulgences with a pithy little rhyme for every coin that in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Pretty effective, don't you think? Maybe we ought to try that next Sunday. <clears throat> Luther was appalled. First, he said, the Pope himself is as rich as Croesus, so he ought to just pay himself to have St. Peter's built. Secondly, he said, scripture is clear that one cannot buy forgiveness of sins or buy one's way into heaven. Of course, the scriptures where one might learn this were written in Latin and taught in Latin, so there was no way for the laity to know this. So one of Luther's emphases was to have the Bible translated into all common languages and made available to people and for worship to be conducted in the languages of the people so that it would be edifying for them to come to worship. And he taught about the Bible and he wrote commentaries about the books of the Bible and he worked hard to help people have resources not just to read the Bible but to understand what they read. Where Luther came out of this from is that he himself had spent his life being overwhelmed by feelings of guilt. He was constantly in despair about how God could possibly love him, how he could possibly be absolved from guilt. But as he continued reading his Bible, he began to hear alternative verses and voices from those that had always been emphasized. And the heart of that liberating message comes in today's passage from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So the watchwords of the Protestant Reformation became grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. The Old Testament had taught that salvation is to be earned 
by obedience to God's law. By the time of Jesus, the main roles of religious authorities were to interpret the laws to people so that they would not disobey them in any way and to offer on their behalf the sacrifices they brought to the temple and intercede for them with God. Jesus brought a new lens and he taught people to pay more attention to the spirit of the law than to the letter of it. And even more importantly, he taught a new concept of God that his father God loved people and wanted more than anything else to be in relationship with people, not primarily wanting to judge and condemn us. He told stories about God being like a shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep who are safe and sound to go search for the one which is lost and restore that lamb to the fold. He told a story about, a God who's like, about God who's like a father who runs out to meet his prodigal son who had demanded his inheritance early <coughs> and had left home to squander it all and now has come groveling home. He doesn't criticize, he doesn't condemn, he embraces and clothes and restores the sonship to his boy. John summarizes the gospel by saying, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever lives and believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God's overwhelming disposition towards people is love. As the Apostle Paul took the gospel to the Gentiles in the early church period, <coughs> he had to face the question of whether Gentiles had to become Jews in order to become Christians. The, Jew, the Christian people still worshiped in the temple and saw themselves as Jews in every way. So the question was, did Gentiles have to obey the Jewish laws, practice the Jewish customs, including circumcision, in order to become Christians? His answer was no. He wrote, at the right time, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, the ungodly. And in today's passage, by grace you have been saved through faith alone. This is not your own doing. It's not the result of your good works. It is a gift from God. But it seems like the default position of churches time and time again is to view God as demanding, judgmental, eager to punish us for each and every wrongdoing. <clears throat> so we revert to legalism and litmus tests and guilt trips and impossible expectations. We tend to believe that God can't possibly love us unless we do enough for him or buy him off Free, unmerited grace just sounds like one of those advertising promises that seems too good to be true. So we put it in the trash can along with those ads and trudge along hoping, hoping that we can earn our way into God's love and into heaven. Well, here's what we need to throw into the trash can. If you get a solicitation from a television evangelist that if you send in a certain amount of money you'll receive certain blessings, throw that in the trash can. If you hear a promise that by giving this much money or doing that many volunteer things you'll receive God's blessing, turn that off. Paul talked about doing these things as well, but he talked about them in the correct order, and that matters. The first truth, the baseline of what we need to know in this life and in this faith, is that God loves us. The God who claimed us in baptism has never wavered in his love for us. We are saved by the free gift of God's grace through Jesus Christ, period. We receive it by faith. We are assured of it by scripture. And this is the blessed assurance we rest in. The Heidelberg Catechism from Luther's era 
in the Reformation time of Germany gets it exactly right. The very first question of the catechism is, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer is that I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven not a hair can fall from my head, indeed that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Now, that sounds like it would be the, the summarizing, concluding statement rather than the opening statement, but it is correct to start with that good news. Because everything we do should be done in glad and grateful response to what God in Jesus Christ has already done for us. Because God has already assured us of his love and of our, of our eternal life, we are, as the Catechism says, wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. So after Paul declares that we're saved by grace through faith, he goes on to say, we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. God has created us to do good in the world, to use the gifts that he has given to make a positive difference. He wants us to give gladly and generously of our possessions to advance important causes and help the needy. He wants us to volunteer our time and energy to a variety of good causes. He wants us to live a life that will be pleasing to him and in accordance with his plan for us. But he wants us to do all of those things because we want to, because we're so thankful for what he has done for us, not because we think we have to do them in order to somehow earn his grudging love and appease his anger. It's the difference between doing something for someone you love because you feel under obligation to do it or feel guilty about not having done more versus doing something for that loved one out of abundant gratitude for having been blessed by that person's life in so many ways for so long. Paul was talking about money when he said this, but he could have been talking about so much more. He wrote, each one should give as they have made up their own mind not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. So giving cheerfully comes from gratitude, from knowing how abundantly we have been blessed, from knowing who the source of all those blessings is in our lives. As we think this week about our stewardship of finances and of time and talents, I hope you'll make a conscious effort to do so from this perspective of gratitude and cheerfulness, not from a perspective of, I really ought to do this, but I'm able to do this, and I want to do this. The starting point makes a huge difference, and the starting point is that we're saved by grace through faith alone, that it's a gift from God, not anything we have or can earn. For my grandfather, who was also a Presbyterian minister, this was the starting and the ending point. He believed this verse was the key to understanding the scriptures as well as one's existence as a human being and as a child of God. So the verse is inscribed on his tombstone in Somerton, South Carolina so that he is still bearing witness to this great truth of the scriptures after his death more than 50 years ago. Right on there with his name, it says, by grace, you have been saved through faith.
The brief statement of faith of the Presbyterian Church says, in life and in death, we belong to God. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The book of Acts gives this summary of what life was like in the post-Pentecost church. It says, day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And so faith, hope, and love abide, these three. The greatest of these is love. And the greatest love is the love of God, which knows no bounds, which will not let us go, which extends amazing grace to people who do not deserve it in any way, shape, or form. Thanks be to God for this amazing grace through which alone we are saved. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we celebrate and respond to this astonishing good news, I invite you to stand and join me in the affirmation of faith, which is the Apostles' Creed, found at the top of page 35 in the front of your hymn books. <coughs> Let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. God, as people gathered in your name and in your service, we give thanks for the blessing that you have bestowed upon us, the blessings of grace, mercy, and love. We know that without these blessings, we would truly be like the rest, by nature, objects of wrath. Even with these blessings, O oh God, many of us still struggle mightily in regards to gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. We ask that you continue to guide us and deliver us from ourselves, the lonely places our hearts wander that we allow no one to see but you. Lord, I am but one of many before you today, seeking forgiveness, redemption, and the grace of your love. But I ask this blessing for all of us in Christ's name and for everyone gathered here today. In this moment, let every heart be still and bared to your healing touch. God, we will leave here soon and we will go out among a world which is hard for us to understand, where mercy, grace, and love seem obscured and often tainted by all the bad things human beings do to each other. We need strength, Lord, because it is so easy to fall into despair when confronted by the tragedy and the bad things that float through all the airwaves to our phones and television sets, where all the bad news one can endure is just a click away. We know that <clears throat> we know that each one of these events affects one of us personally. So we ask for your strength and guidance in order that your will be done through us. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In this moment, Lord, allow us to lift our burdens of walking through this world unto you and bless us with the sight to still see the beauty and wonder that you have created. God, we know that this life is fleeting and we give thanks for all those who have helped us along the way by loving us, sharing friendship with us, and guiding us. Lord, not one of us does not know the pain of loss when you call one we love home. For this moment, we remember all those who have gone before us. People of God, hear this. There will be a day when all of us shine as brightly as the sun. And it will be because of the grace love and mercy freely given by our creator. The good news is that today is that day. And each day forward from here in the grace of our savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the Lord is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. moment for commitment today will be presented by Mr. Jackie Hutter, who has served more years than I can count as our church treasurer. It's really a chore today to stand up here after Mariana's speech last week. It's going to be hard for me to get even close to saying the way from her heart that she talked to this congregation. But... I'm going to do my best. I'll try. I would like to thank you for your past support of the programs at Central through the contributions and willingness to serve on committees and being involved in the programs of the church. 
In order to meet this year's budget, please prayerfully consider your commitments from last year in order for us to meet our current needs over the next two, two months. An example, you know, years ago we did pledges by putting an amount down and we went to a faith pledge and I think it's worked real good and I, I don't, most everybody I think would agree. Uh, what we have is we have a series of committees that actually run the programs in this church and this is only one example of how you, how we need everybody involved. It takes the whole congregation to make it work. And we have a committee system that handles each program. While we have staff members and we have elected deacons and elders who are part of those committees. And what happens is they meet monthly to look at those programs, whether it be youth, you know, we have everything from kids programs to, to senior citizens and those committees look and it takes the elected part of it uh, the pastors input and what we're doing and it takes members of those committees and this is only one example we have to get involved in everything but in order for we're we're now in the process of doing a budget and i don't know if all of you are familiar with how that works but the committees will recommend to the administrative committee, which I'm a part of, because we look at the money each month to know where we are, what to, how the programs are working, and all those functions that make the church work the whole year. And those committees will recommend to us a certain dollar amount budget. We'll look at it as only one stage in it. It's ultimately going to come down to what the session, the elders that are elected, do in terms of what the budget's going to be for the next year but your input if you're a part of a committee is very vital to meeting those needs of this church because you're involved in whether it be sports whether it be the choir and mandy with a choir or uh, family promise or midweek or just any youth programs youth sports all of those things are part of what it takes for the, I think, for us to mature as Christians and to learn and to work together. Because a lot of Christian, in my opinion, being a Christian is being a Christian seven days a week, not just on Sunday when you stand up here. But in, do, in order to do that, we need to be working weekly on how we make this a better church to come to and to do the best we can as, as Christian people. Uh, having said that, there are a whole lot of other committees or functions that you can be involved in, but I would ask that over the next week, since next Sunday is Commitment Sunday, that you commit and pray, to, for, what, pray for whatever you think you can do for this church to make it a better place to worship, and and to and it's like Clark had saying if you if you want to do that electronically it makes it a little easier on the staff in terms of picking up which committee because there's so many committees but and but we still would like for you to bring your commitments to the table because that shows your Christian faith and, and I appreciate it and on behalf of the administrative committee we appreciate everything that's done by each of you to make this a better place to worship. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. And now let us worship God as stewards of what we have been given.
God, in gratitude for all that you have done for us, for your reconciliation through Jesus Christ, for your daily bread and gifts to us, we offer these gifts to you and ask your blessing upon them. And as we think during this next week about next year, we pray that you'll strengthen us to boldly move forward in our stewardship of our time, talents, and possessions. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.